obviously the big news of the day and of the year, and frankly, of the last 20 years, is the Taliban is now in charge of Afghanistan again because Joe Biden decided it would be a wonderful, wonderful idea to simply leave with no plan, with no actual transition, with no support for the people who are still there. And so what we have on our hands is a full-scale disaster area. Now, remember, it was just one month ago that Joe Biden was saying that, don't worry, it's not going to be like Saigon. It's not going to be like the United States leaving Vietnam with helicopters taking off from roofs and the Viet Cong simply rushing in and killing everybody they don't like. It's not going to be anything like that. It'll be orderly. After all, there's a big Afghan army and we've been arming them and supporting them. Here was Joe Biden saying what is now, in retrospect, the dumbest thing he possibly could have said one month ago. Do you see any parallels between this withdrawal and what happened in Vietnam with some people feeling? None whatsoever. Zero. What you had is you had entire brigades breaking through the gates of our embassy. Six, if I'm not mistaken. The Taliban is not the South, the North Vietnamese army. They're not they're not remotely comparable in terms of capability. There's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of a embassy in the of the United States from Afghanistan. It is not at all comfortable. This dunder headed fool, this unbelievable coward. All of that was a lie. That was a lie. And it was perfectly obvious it was a lie at the time. Here's the thing. They're still lying in real time. The Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, he was asked on Sunday whether this was like Saigon. And here is what he had to say. President Biden said that under no circumstance, and that was his word, those were his words, under no circumstance were the U.S. personnel, embassy personnel, be airlifted uh, out of uh Kabul and a replay of the scenes that we saw in Saigon in 1975. Uh, so isn't that exactly what we're seeing now? I mean, even the images uh, are evocative of what happened in Vietnam. Uh, let's take a step back. This is manifestly not Saigon. The fact of the matter is this. We went to Afghanistan 20 years ago uh, with one mission in mind, and that was to deal with the people who attacked us on 9-11. Uh, and that mission has been successful. Okay, this is insane. It's exactly like Saigon. By the way, it's not like Saigon. Let me just show you a picture of Saigon and a picture of what happened the other day. This is side by side. Okay, so on your left-hand side, you'll see Saigon. You have people attempting to escape, attempting to climb on to U.S. helicopters to get out of the way before the Viet Cong rushed in and killed everybody. And on the right, that is an American ferry helicopter that is taking off from the top of the United States Embassy, trying to evacuate people from the top. Nothing like it. Nothing. You see, no resemblances. None. Weird, because they look really exactly the same, like exactly the same. And by the way, you have the Taliban taking full control of the presidential palace in Kabul in scenes reminiscent of Vietnam circa 1975. Here is some of that footage. What you are looking at right now is Taliban fighters inside the presidential palace. Taliban fighters placing their guns on the desk, sitting behind uh, the desk of, we assume that is the uh, desk of the, the, the Afghan president. A fairly stunning turnaround of events in Kabul. Okay, remember, last week, last week, the Biden administration said it would be somewhere between 30 and 90 days before the Taliban even had the capacity to take over Kabul. It took about 30 to 90 hours for them to actually do it. 30 to 90 hours. CNN's Kylie Atwood now reporting the American flag at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul has been taken down. She says this marks a final step in the evacuation of the embassy. Kylie says the withdrawal of uh, embassy personnel is happening, quote, incredibly rapidly today. And the process is now expected to conclude by this evening, she says, uh, minus the small number of diplomats who will stay at the Kabul airport for now. By the way, how bad was this? This was so bad and so rushed and such a botched job that the United States left behind billions of dollars in equipment for the Afghan Taliban to simply take over. According to the Agence France Presse, the United States spent billions supplying the Afghan military with the tools to defeat the Taliban. The rapid capitulation of the armed forces means that, that weaponry is now fueling the insurgents' astonishing battlefield successes. President Joe Biden said, we provided our Afghan partners with all the tools. Let me emphasize all the tools. But the Taliban have just been seizing all of the weapons caches. They, they've, they've picked up Humvees. They've picked up a, Apache attack helicopters. In the western city of Farah, fighters are patrolling in a car marked with an eagle swooping on a snake, which is the official insignia of the country's intelligence services. 
The Taliban blitz has handed the group vehicles, Humvees, small arms and light weapons, weapons, as well as ammunition, according to the weapons tracking group Conflict Armament Research. Experts say that such hauls have given the Taliban a massive boost. The weapons will not only help the Taliban march on Kabul, but strengthen its authority in the cities it has already captured. So they just ended up with a bunch of your taxpayer dollars in their hands in the form of actual weaponry. According to the New York Times, Taliban fighters poured into the Afghan capital on Sunday amid scenes of panic and chaos, bringing a swift and shocking close to the Afghan government and the 20-year American era in the country. President Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan fled the country. A council of Afghan officials, including former President Hamid Karzai, said they would open negotiations with the Taliban over the shape of the insurgency's takeover. By day's end, the insurgents had all but officially sealed their control of the entire country. Hastily arranged American military helicopter flights evacuating the sprawling American embassy compound in Kabul, ferrying American diplomats and the Afghan embassy workers to the Kabul military airport. At the civilian airport next door, Afghans wept as they begged airline workers to put their families on outbound commercial flights, even as most were grounded in favor of military aircraft. There were apparently reports as well that some of the airlines, the civilian airliners, wouldn't let people aboard because they didn't have a COVID test. So they're just going to stay behind and get slaughtered because they didn't have a COVID test. Really solid stuff all the way around for the West. You have a bunch of 8th century barbarians who are now taking over sophisticated military equipment from Western powers. They just took over auspices of the $700 million American embassy in Kabul, sovereign American territory that was just taken over by the Taliban. And of course, the people who were let out were let out largely by fools in the West. And by the way, this is a bipartisan problem. Barack Obama and George... So George... Let's start from the beginning. George W. Bush misdefined the mission in Afghanistan. The mission in Afghanistan was very clearly to get rid of al-Qaeda and get rid of the Taliban to prevent them from taking over again and letting al-Qaeda back in. Okay, the, the mission was not, it was a side mission, it was nice. The mission was not human rights. The mission was not establishment of a long-term democracy. The mission was preventing this from being a terror base. Period, end of story. If that had been made clear over and over and over again, perhaps the American people would have been willing to make the What amounts to, at this point, a relatively minute sacrifice to maintain a small troop presence in Afghanistan? At the time the United States left, there were 3,500 troops on the ground in Afghanistan, largely to control, for example, Bagram Air Base, which is now controlled by the Taliban. Those 3,500 combat troops represented a tiny, minute proportion of American military power all over the world. The last American soldier who had died in combat was killed February 8th, 2020. It has been a year and a half. The United States is spending on average about $40, $45 billion a year on Afghanistan, which amounts to approximately 1% of the federal budget before COVID. Now with the new budgets, it's going to amount to half a percentage point of our federal budget. This was not a quote unquote endless war that required the United States to pull out forthwith, leaving people to be slaughtered in the streets and the Taliban to rush back in to take back over the entire country with no possibility, by the way, of America now being able to stage attacks on actual terrorist positions because we don't have air bases there anymore. We de- and, okay, so George W. Bush missed to find the mission. Fair. Then Barack Obama runs on the platform of pulling out in 2008. And then as president, he realizes that this is actually not such a great idea. And so he sort of takes a halfway position. Instead of actually securing our position in Afghanistan, he starts doing like a mid-range surge. And then he starts m- making backdoor overtures to the Taliban. That continues under President Trump, who also campaigned on ending the war in Afghanistan and was making pretty open overtures to the Taliban. I mean, there there was American negotiation going on with the Taliban in Qatar. And then that was followed by Joe Biden, who decided to finish this thing by simply pulling out with no negotiations, with no possibility of of real commitment, with nothing, for no reason at all. None. Okay, and the net result is going to be that, look, the, the American people apparently are willing to go to war, but we are not willing at this point to see these things through, even if it means a minor, and it is, in, in the scheme of how America's spending goes, in the scheme of, their, of America's military commitment, a minor commitment to baseline security in places like Afghanistan. And by the way, that gap will be filled by somebody. Now, what's, what's funny about this is that was Joe Biden's calculation all along. Joe Biden's calculation was, if I pull out, there will be some sort of political boon for me. I don't think that boon is coming. I think the American people are going to be reawakened to the threat that the Taliban represent and that al-Qaeda represents and that terrorist states in the Middle East represent when there is no militating backlash by the United States and or its allies. In the meantime, however, the United States made a bunch of crucial errors. For example, emptying out Gitmo under Barack Obama, negotiating with the Taliban. Okay, here is a Taliban fighter literally saying, oh yeah, by the way, I was in Gitmo for eight years. 
The United States released a, a bunch of the leaders who are currently in charge of the Taliban were released at the behest of the United States. I was in Guantanamo for eight years. By the way, not just this guy, okay? According to The Guardian, Abdul Ghani Baradar, who's the Taliban leader, he was freed from a Pakistani jail at the request of the United States less than three years ago. He has now emerged as an undisputed victor of the 20-year war. Baradar is the political chief in the most public face. He was said to be on his way from his office in Doha to Kabul on Sunday evening. In a televised statement on the fall of Kabul, he said the Taliban's real test was only just beginning. They had to serve the nation by presumably stuffing women back into bags and or into basements, making sure none of them ever read again, and ensuring that women don't walk publicly without a male next to them. Like this is operating in the in the eighth century seems to be a way of running the nation. Bardar played a succession of military and administrative roles in the five-year Taliban regime. By the time it was ousted, he was deputy minister of defense. During the Taliban's 20-year exile, Bardar had the reputation of being a potent military leader and a subtle political operator. Western diplomats came to view him as on the wing of the Ketashura, the Taliban's regrouped leadership in exile that was most resistant to ISI control, that's the Pakistani intelligence service, and most amenable to political contacts with Kabul. The Obama administration was more fearful of his military expertise than hopeful about his supposedly moderate leanings. The CIA tracked him down in Karachi in 2010 and then persuaded the ISI, which is the Pakistani Secret Service, to arrest him. In 2018, Washington's attitude changed. Donald Trump's Afghan envoy, Zalmay Khalilzad, asked the Pakistanis to release Baradar so he could lead negotiations in Qatar because everybody on both sides of the aisle decided that this was not a war worth a minimum of effort at this point at all. Now, I think all of that is wrong. But even if you think all of that is right, what is certainly wrong is the insane way that Joe Biden just decided to pull out of this thing. Even if you think it's good policy for the United States not to be involved in Afghanistan, the way that Joe Biden has performed this is the crappiest way anyone could have ever performed this. It, it truly is an astonishing failure by Joe Biden, who also is saying that he's not going to do any pressers. He's, he's not doing No need. Does he have to talk to you? Nah, Matlock is on. He, he's too busy. He's got things going on. Things are getting incredibly ugly over there, obviously. CNN reporter Clarissa Ward, she says people here are absolutely terrified. We can certainly hear quite a lot of gunfire going on over the course of the last hour or two, particularly, I should say. Again, very difficult to know what exactly that gunfire is because you do hear a lot of it in Kabul. But certainly fair to say there's a lot more of it tonight than we we're used to hearing. Uh, and certainly also fair to say that people here in the capital are utterly petrified and essentially have nowhere to look to now. That, of course, is no shock at all. People are attempting to flee and the videos are just horrifying. In the video, if this was not supposed to be like Saigon, I just have a question. How? In the, maybe it's not like Saigon. Maybe it's just World War Z because these videos look like World War Z. It looks like the zombie invasion is coming and people are attempting to get on planes. They're, they're, they're climbing up the, the on-ramps on the planes and they're just flooding them. There's no organization whatsoever. It's insanity. Here's some of the videos. You can see this. Those are civilian airliners in the background. People flooding onto the tarmac, desperately attempting to get out. People showing up with their families, trying to leave before the Taliban come in and kill everybody who is perceived as a collaborator. That was just some of the video. The, the evacuations underway at Kabul airport are shocking. Some of the video shows people, it's a lot closer up. You can see people actually climbing up the stairs and, and they're just falling off the railings. I mean, it's, it's utter insanity. And Afghans are, of course, being stranded by the thousands by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands at this point. None of this should be any sort of shock at all, because it isn't. According to the Wall Street Journal, Rahmat said he was relieved when the Central Intelligence Agency phoned him for an interview and weeks later arranged to shelter him on an Afghan base while the State Department processed his application for a visa to flee Afghanistan. He feared the Taliban were hunting him down for his work spying for the CIA in a remote, in a remote border area of Afghanistan for almost a decade and lacked the paperwork to apply for a visa. But Rahmat isn't in the clear. The Taliban are advancing on Kabul. Even if he can make it to the capital from his hideout in a province hours away, the Afghan commander of the base has since told him he can't shelter there. I'm very worried, he said in a text message. We are feeling in danger here. Please save our family. Rahmat's story reflects the fears of thousands of Afghans who helped the U.S. during the war and now face a desperate race to leave the country. The Wall Street Journal agreed to only use his first name to protect his safety as best they can. About 18,000 families who have applied for the U.S.'s special immigrant visa remain on the ground in Afghanistan. 
Okay, this is, as of two days ago, okay, thousands, 18,000 families remaining on the ground in Afghanistan. No way to get out. Half of those are outside Kabul. You know, areas either already under Taliban control or likely to fall soon, which now is everything because it's all fallen. In addition, the State Department this month said tens of thousands more Afghans would be eligible for priority treatment under U.S. Refugee Settlement Program. The new criteria applied to Afghans who work for U.S. contractors, U.S.-funded programs, and U.S.-based media or non-governmental organizations, as well as their families. But how the hell are you going to get them out? The answer is now, you're not. You're not, because you had no orderly transition process. The entire place has been taken over by the barbarians from the 8th century. No one is getting out. Former soldiers, aid workers, others who previously worked in Afghanistan have been inundated with requests from former Afghan colleagues and employees seeking letters of recommendation and help in fleeing the country. This is just obviously horrifying stuff. It's going to get more horrifying, by the way. The footage will eventually emerge of people simply being shot because the Taliban is apparently doing this. The Taliban is simply taking places over and murdering people. The New York Times reporting on what it's like living under the Taliban as they rush into Kunduz. It was his first day as the Taliban-appointed mayor of Kunduz, and Gul Mohammed Elias was on a charm offensive. Last Sunday, the insurgents seized control of the city in northern Afghanistan, which was in shambles after weeks of fighting. Power lines were down. The water supply powered by generators did not reach most residents. Trash and rubble littered the streets. The civil servants who could fix those problems were hiding at home, terrified of the Taliban. So the, so the insurgent commander turned mayor, summoned some to his new office to persuade them to return to work. I said our jihad is not with the municipality. Our jihad is against the occupiers and those who defend the occupiers. But day by day, as municipal offices stayed mostly empty, Mr. Elias grew more frustrated and his rhetoric grew harsher. Taliban fighters began going door to door, searching for absentee city workers. Hundreds of armed men set up checkpoints across the city. At the entrance to the regional hospital, a new notice appeared on the wall. Employees must return to work or face punishment from the Taliban. Just a week after the fall of Kunduz, the insurgents are now in effective control of Afghanistan. Now they must function as administrators who can provide basic services to hundreds of thousands of people. In just days, the insurgents, frustrated by their failed efforts to cajole civil servants back to work, began instilling terror, according to residents reached by telephone. I'm afraid. I don't know what will happen and what they will do, said one. We have to smile at them because we are scared, but we are deeply unhappy. Three days after the Taliban took control in Kunduz, Atakula Omar Kiel, a civil servant, received a call from an insurgent fighter telling him to go to his office. The mayor of Kunduz wanted to speak with him. Mr. Omar Kiel had been staying home since the retreat of government forces as insurgents flooded into the streets and a sense of unease gripped the battered city. He had experienced a similar moment twice before when the Taliban seized Kunduz in 2015 and 2016. Both times, the insurgents were pushed back with help from the American airstrikes. This time, days after the Taliban took control, the entire Afghan army corps charged with reclaiming the city surrendered to the insurgents. They gave them their weapons and they gave them their vehicles. All of the government's vehicles, garbage trucks, and computers were exactly where he had left them before the Taliban took over and young fighters poured into the city. The only sign of change was blank spaces on the walls where photos of President Ashka Ashraf Ghani had been. Instead, the Taliban's white flags had been hung. Mr. Elias assured the workers they would not be targeted by the Taliban and instructed them to return to work to improve morale. Halfway through the meeting, a shopkeeper pleaded with the Taliban bodyguard to see the mayor. Like hundreds of others, his kiosk had been mostly destroyed by fire during the Taliban's final push. He said shopkeepers wanted the Taliban's promise they could return to the market to collect their things safe, safely. The mayor complied. For the rest of the day, Elias met with other municipal leaders trying to get services restored. There was some progress, but nearly every shop is closed. The shopkeepers are fearing that they will be looted by the Taliban fighters. About 500 Taliban fighters were stationed around the city, manning checkpoints on nearly every street corner. By the end of the week, many residents' fears were being realized at the regional hospitals. Taliban fighters seized a list of employees' phone numbers and home addresses, began calling them, demanding they return to work. One person who had fled to Kabul received a call from a Taliban fighter demanding he return to work. At the hospital, armed Taliban were keeping track of attendance. Female staff wore sky blue burqas as they assisted in surgeries intended to wounds from the airstrikes. Just uh, things are going to go great. Things are going to go just beautifully. Okay, so it's not just that there are terrible ramifications for everybody who is stuck in Afghanistan, of course. It's that there are bad ramifications for the United States. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, when he's not lecturing everybody about the evils of, of white privilege, he told senators on Sunday, a previous assessment of how soon terrorist groups will reconstitute in Afghanistan will speed up. On a Sunday phone call between top Biden officials and senators from both parties, Senator Lindsey Graham asked Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Milley whether they will revise an assessment to Congress in June of a medium risk of terrorist groups reconstituting in Afghanistan within two years. Milley said yes. He would have to assume that timeline would now be moved up. He would be happy to brief senators in the classified setting. 
Sources on the call described a surreal experience listening in on the Biden officials brief them on the situation while checking their cell phones and seeing real-time chaos unfolding in Kabul. Senators from both parties pressed Milley and Austin on efforts to evacuate U.S. personnel and the many thousands of Afghans who helped Americans in the war effort and are desperately trying to escape. A source said the sad reality is there's no way they can evacuate by August 31st the more than 20,000 Afghans who want to escape the country. And that's not including their families. You're probably talking more like 75 or 80,000 people who want to escape the country and are not going to be able to get out. Two takeaways for me, what said one source, we're going to leave tens of thousands of people behind and a timeline in terms of threats has now accelerated. Remember, that was the original reason we went there in the first place. Anthony Blinken was asked, is the Taliban controlled territory now going to become a hotbed of terrorism again? And just avoided the question, as he is apt to do. You don't think that Afghanistan now is going to become a hotbed of of terrorism? Jake, we have uh, tremendously more capacity than we had before 9-11 when it comes uh, to counterterrorism. In places around the world where we don't have forces on the ground, in Yemen, uh, in parts of, uh, of Africa, in parts of Syria, we're able to deal with any potential terrorist threat uh, to our country. And we're doing that every single day. And look, uh, I can't tell you what, uh, what the Taliban is going to do. Um, that would be a complete non-answer. So he asked him, is Afghanistan going to become a terror hotbed? And he's like, well, Yemen isn't. So, well, I noticed that Yemen isn't in Afghanistan. So that's a weird answer, Anthony Blinken. By the way, when the United States leaves a vacuum, somebody rushes in to fill it, according to Foreign Policy magazine. It is not merely a question of what happens in Afghanistan. It's also a question of the United States' global enemies maximizing their benefit right now. According to foreignpolicy.com, U.S. President Joe Biden's announcement U.S. troops will be gone from Afghanistan by August 31st will remove the most formidable obstacle to total Taliban takeover of the country. For 20 years, the U.S. presence in Afghanistan, though not always appreciated, has nevertheless served as a predictable and stabilizing force. Now, the prospect of renewed Taliban rule has sparked major anxiety among the region's powers. For example, earlier this month, Indian Minister of External Affairs S. Jaishankar visited Moscow and Tehran while Taliban representatives were in each city, raising questions about whether back-channel negotiations are ongoing. So India doesn't want to be on the outside looking in because Afghanistan, which will ally presumably with Pakistan, now provides a threat to India. So India is going to start making overtures to Afghanistan. Meanwhile, China is going to be making overtures to Afghanistan as well. Russia is making overtures to the Taliban. Moscow is preparing to leverage the Six Nation Collective Security Treaty Organization to address potential trouble at the Afghan-Tajik border, which is being taken over by the Taliban on the Afghan side. Islamabad has now negotiated, that's, that's Pakistan, a quid pro quo with the Taliban to reject U.S. bases on Pakistani territory in exchange for the Taliban's assistance in combating Pakistan's own Taliban-style militants. So now it's not even that the United States is going to lose its bases in Afghanistan. Also, the U.S. is going to have no staging bases in Pakistan. Okay, which is next door. So there went the security cooperation with Pakistan, whatever that was worth. Amid all of this regional angst, China is quietly attempting to secure its interest in post-U.S. Afghanistan. Beijing has been actively engaging with Kabul on construction of a Peshawar-Kabul motorway, which will connect Pakistan to Afghanistan and make Kabul a participant in China's Belt and Road Initiative. Up until now, Kabul didn't want to do that because the United States was helping them out. Now, Beijing is building a major road through the Wakhan Corridor, a slim strip of mountainous territory connecting China's westernmost province of Zhangjiang to Afghanistan and onward to Pakistan and Central Asia. According to a 2014 report, Afghanistan may possess nearly a trillion dollars worth of extractable rare earth metals locked within its mountains. China will now have some control over that. Yes, when the United States leaves a vacuum, bad things happen. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Ben Shapiro Show. If you did, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date with all our future content.